Thank you for joining us today. This is computer architecture. We're in module two on the second uh, in our um, new module, second, second module of content. And uh, the focus here is logic gates, Boolean operators, logic gates, and truth tables. We touched on some of this on Monday before we got into the review of our module one assessment. And so I believe we were further down here. We, we wrapped up on Monday uh, talking about how this Boolean function, which is a combination of Boolean operators or with and, those uh, operators do their thing with the three inputs, the three inputs X, Y, and Z. And that result is funneled through a not operator, right? So whatever the result is from in here, once that's performed, the output is flipped. So if it was a one coming out of there, it's now a zero. If it was a zero coming out of there, it's a one. Does this ring a bell or do you do you recall this part of our review from Monday? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is something that I wanted to take a, a little bit of quality time to explain. So as we remember that Boolean operators and logic gates. This is the a Boolean operator is the software version or the programming version of a Boolean um, a Boolean method. And then logic gates are the hardware version of the same thing. And there are three basic logic gates, three basic Boolean operators, whether you're dealing with software or you're dealing with hardware. So whenever you see logic gates, you want to think hardware. Whenever you see Boolean operators, you want to think, okay, I'm programming or this is software. It's the same thing. There's three of them and or with not in the mix. And they're like Legos. So we've used the analogy that they're like Legos. You can kind of combine them in really interesting ways to create a function. And when you have more than one operator, it's no longer called a Boolean operator, it's called a Boolean function. When, it, when we're talking about logic gates, if it's the physical equivalent of that, what you have is a compound logic gate or a logic gate combination. But, but people tend to say compound or complex logic gate. So when you hear the word compound logic gate, we're talking about two or more logic gates together. When you hear the word complex logic gate, that's, that's when you have like three, four, five, six, right? And, there, and there's different mixes of ands, ors, and nots. So the terminology is really important. The One of the challenges of this uh, way of working with hardware, and, and we, test, we test our ideas in software, and then we build the hardware. So, so that's another question that you might be asking yourself. It's like, you know, this is the this is the computer architecture class. This is supposed to be all about hardware. Well, oftentimes when we build prototypes, when we have working models of a thing before we go to production, we run trials in the in the world of software with it, right? And then if the if the function operates predictably, right? If the function if the function that's created is working like it's supposed to. And then we need to take it to scale where it's going to be a million times more efficient because we're going to put that that beautiful algorithm into the mix with some hardware that we market. We're going to build a digital device. 
and it's an innovative digital device that will revolutionize your home and uh, you know all that kind of stuff, right? You can control everything in your home with your smartphone, stuff like that, right? Uh, after the trials are done on the software level and you're ready to market something, um, you want to do it, you want to put that out in the marketplace in a reliable, consistent, efficient, cheap way. That's when we go to the physical side and we build the digital components, right? We build the electronics. So, so that's kind of the, the larger process that industry works through as they're working research and development for new types of chips and new types of devices. If you've ever wondered what they're doing and how they're doing, you're, you're getting a bird's eye view. This convention, whenever you see this, it's telling you, this is a statement that means, okay, we're, we're about to express or create a function which means there's going to be more than two or more Boolean operators. And it's common practice in parentheses to list the inputs first. Okay. So you start the statement by using this italicized letter F, and that's an abbreviation for the word function. And when what you see inside the parentheses are the inputs, we have three inputs. One is labeled input A, input B, and input C. Does everybody, are there any questions about that? No, you're good. Okay, so if that's true, I'm just gonna put that to the test. Uh, can anyone tell me for this function, how many inputs do I have? Mm, not a trick question, not trying to trap somebody. Three? Three is correct, thank you. And how do I, how do I identify each of those inputs? What are their labels? Anyone? Everybody with me still? Yes. All right. If you're still with me. Let's try this a little differently. I'm going to create a Boolean function. And then after it, I get I get proof that it's working, I'm going to create hardware that does the job. Okay. This is this is my introduction to the function. How many how many inputs do I have for this function? Count three. All right. I heard two, then I heard three. How many letters do we have or how many, we have two now, right? So we have two inputs and how are they labeled? They're labeled X and Y, right? Does everybody understand what I'm getting at here? Uh, let's do this again. I have a function and this time for this function, how many inputs do I have? Three. Three is correct. Here I had two inputs because there's just two in the list inside the parentheses. Thank you. Here I have three. Now, how are each of those inputs labeled in this case? 
How's the second input labeled? C C D. C D is correct. Thank you. So if I say, what's the third input? How do I know I'm dealing with the third input? I'm looking for EF. The, the thing I want you to understand is that functions can get really interesting. And sometimes in the best of circumstances, you have sensible people who are labeling their inputs differently, like with more than just single letters. Now for our intent and purposes, right? Okay, let's keep going. We're on a roll here. Okay, everybody with me? Let's pretend that I'm building a new gadget that's going to revolutionize the way we capture solar energy, right? And um, I know this is hypothetical, but I'm starting with a basic function. How many function? How many inputs do I have for this function right here? just two okay and what's the label for each of those inputs solar heat and steam out now i could make this i could say uh solar heat in and it's measured in calories steam out in liters. So that's a volume, right? You can measure steam output in liters. And and it can be, and steam can actually be, so it can have a volume, it can have a temperature. Point is, is that you can, one of the things that's that's important to understand about programming and computer science is that we're working with programming languages. And I've taken this up in other classes but I've often stated, you know what? And, and, in, and in the um, scientific computing applications course, I make a big point of this. We do our students a disservice by only using single letter var variable names, right? And because that triggers in the back of your head, something like math. Oh, this is like algebra. And then there are things that click in the thought process that follow along with that by extension it's just human nature. And, and then we then we have code that doesn't work. And it's because half of our brain is still thinking in the back side of it without even being aware of it that, oh, this is algebra somehow. And what I'm going to do on occasion is I'm going to mix it up. And I just want you to be aware. For efficiency purposes, much of the time, I will continue using single letter variables for input to identify inputs. But there are going to be times where I want to mix it up or, or spell things out in more explicit terms because one of our failings as we teach students how to work with technology is, is to explain you're gonna do much better in a programming language when you take advantage of what a language can do. When I look at this input, I know what it's for. So when I'm having bugs or problems I'm trying to solve, it's easier to resolve those problems with more information in the mix. If all I have is X and Y, and I have a dozen functions and they're all built the same way, and there's 12 different uses of X and Y, and then I get an error from my code that says, X is not blah, 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 blah. The first challenge is, oh shoot, which of the 12 Xs is this error talking about? Does everybody feel what I'm talking Do we have any programmers in the, do we have any programming students in the mix here? Uh, oh yeah, all of you are mostly, all of you have had programming courses or are taking programming courses. So I I just, I just wanna take a time on a Friday, which is where we explore value added things. You, you should 
try some of these things out where you use more descriptive ways to label your inputs. And if your result works the same, continue the practice. You'll be one of those few people where when they look at your design or they look at your code or they look at your digital components, they'll go, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. It's simple, but elegant. And I understand what I'm looking at. People will love you to death and they'll hire you in an instant and they'll pay you more. I'm not making this up, okay? It's just a value added moment on our Friday. Um, so I don't want this to throw you. If we have an assessment item on the assessment for module two, and I talk about a function that has these inputs, right? I don't want you to get freaked out because wait a minute, half the, you know, most of the examples we work with have single letter variables. What am I looking at? I want you to get used to the idea that, that we can think and work outside the box. And that's one of our greatest failings in our discipline is that we're always using those single letter variables because it's much quicker and easier to type, right? Except that we overdo it and then we have 12 we have 12 different X's and Y's, and then we have a bug in our code or a problem with our digital component, and we just can't find our way out of the tangle. So, so if any of you are working the solution for this module and you can't get it to work, I'm going to work with you one-on-one -on -one and we're going to try stuff like this, and you'd be amazed at how, how helpful that is. Okay, um, let's move on. That's what negative transfer is about, right? We see something like this and we say, oh, we're adding these two because there's a plus sign. But if we see the word and, that's multiplication. And we tend to associate the word and with this plus sign. And is a different Boolean function that actually means multiplication. We've been over this before, yes? Yes. Okay. Like two and three are five. Our mental process in terms of the language is, oh, we're adding, but and is multiplication. So you have to unlearn. You'll see what I mean when we get started with this. Okay, so here is our beautiful moment. This is our beautiful moment. And I'm going to claim that phrase for the first time in all the years that I've taught computer architecture. I want you as a student in this class to get out a pen and some paper or a stylus. If your thing is I've got a tablet and I've got a stylus and I'm going to draw with my finger. That's okay. You can do that. But in our industry, when you're working with physical components, the logic gates that perform the same function as a Boolean operator, that perform the same task as a Boolean operator. In the physical world, the diagram for the AND logic gate in its simplest form is that there are two inputs and there's one output. It's the out that happens is either a one or a zero. And this view of it, this view of the logic gate is referred to as the interface view. We'll get into that in a minute. This is the basic view. There's stuff inside here that makes and work like it does, okay? So there's other stuff inside here under the hood. This is, this is kind of like looking the outside of a car and, and, and realizing that under the hood in the front, there's a whole engine in there. Does everybody see that? Okay. Now, the other thing I want you to understand and, and be very, very intentional about is what's the difference between this portion of the and and this portion of the or? Graphically, what's the difference? How is and different from this? Can, can someone volunteer to answer? 
how is this part of the AND diagram different from this and from this? The AND diagram is acquainted by the output. I'm sorry, what? On the outside, the and isn't pointed. Well, the other two are. Correct. There's no point. It's rounded. In fact, if you look closely, this is almost like a half a circle, isn't it? That's like a half circle. Now, in every previous course I've taught, every single previous course I've taught in this subject matter, I didn't take the time to call that out. And, and this last summer I was reflecting on, how can I improve this course? And I think this is one thing. I'm gonna ask you to draw these things over and over and over again. You're gonna become an artiste by the time you finish this course, every one of you. In your own way, with your own tools, you're gonna to draw these logic gates and then you're gonna draw how they fit together. And when you're using these Legos, you're gonna give me a diagram. And that's cool because you're working with your hands. And some of you are very visual as learners. So the, the good news is you don't have to be a logical genius to get this class or this course and do well here. If you can just abide by certain non-negotiables, if you turn in a diagram, and I'm just telling you this up front, and something that's supposed to be an and that's labeled an and has any kind of point if it has any kind of point in your drawing, I'm going to kick it back. I'm going to say, mm, nope, no, no, no. That's confusing because visually we don't normally, you'll see these logic gates, but they won't normally be labeled. You won't have and in the, on the inside of this to cue you to the fact. It'll just be the shape. It won't be labeled and. It'll just be the shape. It won't be labeled or. It'll just be the shape, it won't be labeled not. But the, but the details matter because I want you to notice that not has this funny little circle on the front, yeah? That's kind of different. So it has a point, but then it has a small circle. And I'm calling that out too, because later on we're gonna combine these. And when we combine these, if I take the or, and I add that funny little circle, it becomes a not or, which is also called a nor. Now, do any of you remember your childhood books? Did, did any of you read like books when you were children? You know, you'd sit down with an adult and you'd read these childhood books? Yeah. Yes. Right. And some of the books would be about a magical make-believe place, right? And in this magical make-believe place, there were interesting creatures and characters, and they'd have interesting names. I want you to make a game out of this. So I want you to think, okay, I have three characters, and if I combine them, like not with a little circle, if I put a little circle in front of here, graphically, I've added the not to the front of the and, and now I've created a NAND. Oh, that rhymes! And I'm recording this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna try to do some kind of home run and wrap this. Uh, no, no, that would be too embarrassing. I'm sorry for even, this is a Friday, right? I mean, we are supposed to be lighthearted and hands-on on a Friday, right? Okay, so if I take a knot and I sign it, if I take a knot and I combine it with an and, now I have a nan. If I take a knot and I combine it with an or, now I have a nor. Right? All right, there was a question. I heard someone. Or a comment. Uh, come again, please. No, I was saying you should go for it and try to write. I should go for it? Yeah. I, but I'll tell you what, I need some help with it. Um, or, would you be willing to coach me? Because... I mean, like, I'm an old, I'm, I'm an not old a white rapper. dude, let's face it. I look like an old goat, right? So I'm going to need some help. I don't want to embarrass myself, but thank you for the encouragement. All right. Are there any, are there any uh, observations, questions?
questions or comments about the differences here. Can, can I get you to tell me what's the difference between the shape that leads to this point and the shape that leads to this point? Would anyone volunteer? How is this shape that leads to this point different from this shape that leads to this point? It's round. Yes. It's rounded or sloped or curved as opposed to this progression, which is straight. Those differences are incredibly important, okay? And I'm gonna say it again. The fact that we use single letters to identify the inputs, that becomes an Achilles heel later on. But for the purposes of keeping it simple, I have in its most basic form, an and with two inputs, A and B, and when we finish doing what it does, there's a single value that comes out. That's why there's a single line coming out, okay? So there's two values going in, only one value coming out. It seems obvious, but it's worth calling out. Here, for the or, I have how many values going in? Someone. Two. Two values, thank you, sir. And. What are their, how are they identified? A and B. A and B, excellent, thank you. And how many values do I have coming out? One. One, exactly. And this is visual, right? I mean, you have two lines going in on the left side, and by the time we process something, there's only one value coming out. What about this one? This is where we ask for the brave people in the class to answer. How many inputs do I have here? Just one. Just one. Give the man a cigar. Thank you. How many outputs do we have? One. Just one. Now here is another difference between this logic gate and the ands and ors. When you combine the ands with the ands, you can have an and with three inputs, four inputs, eight inputs, 16 inputs, 32 inputs, 64 inputs. Have you ever heard of like 32-bit processors, 64-bit processors? Yeah? 32-bit memory? 64-bit memory. You know what I'm talking about, right? You read the specs for a new phone. Oh, this phone has a what kind of processor? 32-bit processor, 64-bit processor. We're going from A to Z and then double A, double B, double C, you know, if you want to keep it simple, right? So this is an example of ands and ors can be multiple inputs, more than two. You can have four, you can have as many as you want, one through infinity, or you can have as many inputs as you want, one through infinity. But how many outputs do you have? Only one. Only one. How many outputs, if, if you have 5,382 inputs for an OR, how many outputs do you have for that OR? Only one. So these, these are like the basic concepts for and, or, and not that we need to fuse, burn, sear into our memory, okay? Because those are the absolutes that are going to help us keep straight. When we start combining these shapes like Lego, like Lego, uh, as long as you get that there's only ever one output, We're good. Because that's going to be one thing that'll keep you from like screwing up a diagram, messing up a, a design. Okay. Because you're going to become designers and builders in this class. And, and that is the coolest, sexiest part of this, of this subject matter. I, I got to tell you, being able to build your own memory chip, I mean, who gets to do that? 
seriously. In just a few weeks, you're going to do that. You're going to build your own memory chips from scratch. And then when you finish our program, if you want, you can put in for a job at Intel, AMD. You can make that six-figure salary. You can come and visit when you feel like it in your Learjet. Okay, okay, I'm exaggerating, but and or and not. <clears throat> we said that this view is the simple version. We call this the interface view. We don't see the engine under the hood, but if we show the implementation view of a logic gate, what we're doing is taking the inside of this and exploding it out here so we can see what goes inside of it. When we build a three input AND out of two ANDs, we have an A input and a B input for the first AND. There's a single output that becomes the input, the top input for the second AND. But the AND at a minimum has two inputs. So there's a second input for this AND which is sliced all the way in at the bottom or spliced all the way in at the bottom. So this AND at a minimum has two inputs. The combined output of this AND and the single input for the bottom part of the second AND. There is a single output, only one output, only one output. Does everybody get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Now, at its most basic level, if we want to talk about how to make sense out of how this thing functions, we use a truth table. And what we're going to do is talk about the truth table on Monday. Okay? But what I want you to do is to read the rest of this over the weekend so that you understand. This is, by the way, this is the... This is the image that's painted onto a key on my keyboard. So this is an image that's on the physical keyboard. If you look at your own physical keyboard, I just want to explain that. Look at your own physical keyboard above your enter key. You'll see a, back, a backslash and then another one that looks like a straight line. On your keyboard, these two white lines might be fused together and it looks like a single long it almost looks like an upper, a lowercase L, right? Does everybody see what I'm talking about? Look at your own keyboard right now. I need somebody to look, tell me and say, yeah, I'm looking at it. I get what you're talking about. I'm looking at it. Okay. Now the truth will set you free. Truth tables, right? What are we doing with truth tables? Here's a preview of coming attractions. A truth table is a simple method we use to interpret the possible behaviors of a logic gate or a Boolean operator. In this case, if we're talking about the OR, I have two inputs, A and B. And when I feed something into those two inputs, I can feed a zero and a zero in both. I'll feed a zero into the A and a zero into the B. I'll feed a zero into the A or a one into the B. I can also feed a one into the A and a zero into the B. And then finally, what's the other possibility with two inputs? I can feed a one into the A. I can also feed a one into the B. Now, the way that OR works is that when you combine the inputs, if any of the inputs are a one, then the output is a one, okay? So again, this is just a preview of coming attractions. I have a zero for the A, I have a zero for the B. If A is a one or B is a one, then the output is a one. <gasps> oh no! In this case, in the first case, if the A is a, a zero and the B is a zero, then neither of the inputs are a one. 
So the only possible answer I can get out of an or is a zero. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? If A is a one or B is a one, then the out is a one. That's how or works. In the first possible example, if A is zero and B is zero, neither one of them are a one. So the only answer I can get out is false. Are there any trues going into the or? No, that's false. I want you to reflect on those words. This is that simple. But you kind of get it, kind of got to get that that uh, process down in your head. All right. What we're going to do is close from here. D does anyone have any observations or comments based on the information we've shared today? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and stop recording. Good luck with your final attempt of the module one assessment. And we'll see you to continue our review of basic logic gates and Boolean operators on Monday.